Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. Dave, the, the keynotes of the morning are finished. The, the buzz and energy on the show floor is really exciting. There's yeah, lots of excitement buzzing, going on. Right, I mean, last night was a lot of action and it's still packed today, I mean, really packed. Yeah, day three of the conference, but, but things are really getting, heating up. Um, I'd like to introduce our next two guests. We have Mark DaCosta, he is the head of data innovation and commercialization at BNY Mellon. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. And Cindy Housen, Chief Data Strategy Officer at ThoughtSpot. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, both of you. Thanks for having both nice. of us. So both of you have really cool titles, particularly for this moment in time in the, in the enterprise AI date, uh, era. Mark, I want to start with you. Tell us a little bit about your role at BNY Mellon. So, so I report to the Chief Data Officer at BNY Mellon and my role is head of data innovation, and what is that? It's really about uh, data strategy and innovation, and what, what's really great about my role is I get to uh, look at some of the latest things that are coming down the pike, uh, assess it from a strategy perspective, and in many instances, uh, take that and then hand it off to other teams. You know, one of the things that I've been able to do is uh, with uh, um, ThoughtSpot and then Snowflake, those, those are points where I uh, innovated them, worked on the strategy, and then never let them go. Because I really think that those are going to be really transformative uh, pieces to both the, the company's future and their clients. Cindy, as you know, the, the chief data officer role has evolved quite dramatically, right? It used to be this back office role. It wasn't even called the chief data officer, but it was this data quality, keep it in the back room. And now <laughs> firms like Snuff, ThoughtBot have brought it to the fore so that end users can actually interact with data. Of course, you still have to trust the data. How have you seen that, that role evolve in your career? Yeah, and this is where we're even seeing a change in the title to Chief Data and Analytics Officer. And in some organizations, it's Chief Data and AI Officer because if you're only collecting data and not putting it in the hands of the business users or at the point of impact, you're really just a cost. And it's about going from that defensive, protect the data, to offensive, make that data actionable, and get the insights. So financial services, so the, 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 the CDO role first emerged really in, in regulated industries, financial services, healthcare, public sector, uh, and in a way, you should be, in theory, in a better position to take advantage of AI because everybody's really concerned about data quality and, and the legal aspects of it. How do you feel about that in terms of the bank's ability to add AI to its data estate? What's the state of, of, of data? So, so the, the um, LLMs uh, and generative AI has just been uh, like an amazing kind of jolt to the, the organization in the industry. Uh, the focus on on that new technology and the, the um, prospect that it has, has, has then just turbocharged the focus on data. Because you need to have that data in order to power all of those new cool things. And so it's, it, it's been really complementary to what we've been doing within the, the chief data office. Um, we've been there focused on data largely for driving, to your point, um, regulatory items. Now that same data, that same governed data, is, is there to power uh, commercial, commercial outcomes. So the, the, the timing in terms of being, being in the space and being in the chief, chief data office space at the time where uh, AI and LLM is just really taking, taking the hill has been uh, really an exciting place to be. So Cindy, the old saying, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. Well, the money's in financial <laughs> services. Everybody wants yeah. to disrupt financial services. How do you see Gen AI affecting financial services? Of course, you had you know, the whole crypto thing. You've got changes in wealth management. Is it ripe for, uh, for disruption? And how do you help customers uh, like Mark not get disrupted or disrupt themselves? Yeah, no, they have to disrupt themselves. That's why Mark also is charged with innovation. Mm -hmm. There's keeping the lights on, but there's also innovation. And you made an important distinction in your part two question, Dave, and I, we need your help with this. There's a lot of AI washing, and we have to distinguish between Gen AI, which has given the industry the jolt that Mark referred to, 
and regular AI machine learning that of course, if I apply for a mortgage at BNY, they're, they're using traditional AI. The gen AI is what is really important and revitalizing this industry that has taken it now to a boardroom conversation. What is our data strategy? Because without a data strategy, you cannot have an AI strategy. And how quickly can we take advantage of gen AI? With BNY Mellon investing in products and platforms like Snowflake, that puts them in a better position to leverage generative AI. Well, this is really interesting because it, it's, it's about organizational change here. You know, it, it's really about shifting mindsets, changing the way people think about data, but also how they do their jobs. What are you seeing in both of, of your organizations in terms of bringing people along? Because as you said, it's a boardroom conversation, but that has to filter down to the rank and file too. So, I mean, if, if it's all right, I'll take that first. So, um, it, 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 it's all about timing. So. As this, this whole focus on generative AI and, and uh, data transformation is taking place, the organization's also going through an organizational transformation. So we're going through a, a platform operating model. So think about this in terms of, um, previously we grew up and we might have had payments sitting across you know, 18 different lines of business. Now all of that is, is being aligned into one product for us to go to market with clients. Those teams, in turn, are turning around, looking at their data infrastructure and strategy and realizing, I, I, I need more, I need scale, I need cloud scale. So there's, there's a big element of being in the right place at the right time, and so what we had been doing with, with Snowflake in terms of creating a very tenanted um, structure that was governed to enable all these different lines of business that, that came together at the right time. We're doing the same thing with with ThoughtSpot, as we start to shift the data gravity to the cloud, we're trying to offer ThoughtSpot as a tenanted service as well. Once we get to cloud, we can start to let off the reins a bit more and allow the teams to individually manage these tenanted pieces of infrastructure and services in order to meet the needs for their businesses and their clients. Explain why. Is it the, just the flexibility? Uh, is there is it a cost factor, a scalability? I, I think it's a bit of both. So when we've been on the, the Snowflake journey in, in, in earnest for about a year in the regulated entity. We've been on the um, ThoughtSpot journey for three years. So for, for the, the first two years, we are working with ThoughtSpot, which is a cloud powered solution, but in an on-prem mode. Very constrained, you can try to get it to work, you know, you, we, we got it to work, we got great outcomes, but you're ultimately running in against kind of hardware limitations and, and scale. So as we started to break through into the cloud with, with Snowflake, you're now no longer having to kind of shift and move and copy data. It's, it's a, ThoughtSpot has a really thin layer that sits, complements Snowflake very well, it, it brings, uh, pushes down all that processing to Snowflake. It's not, it's not moving and shuttling the data or caching the data. It's very, very thin, and that in itself then means that you can just tap into Snowflake scale. So you, what, what you couldn't do in any way on-prem now becomes possible once you're, you've kind of broken through into the cloud with both ThoughtSpot and Snowflake. So you get the cloud as the underlying infrastructure. It, it, could you talk to the business value that you're getting? Because ThoughtSpot's all about democratizing data, providing you know, wider access. How are, you, how are you taking advantage of that vision? So, so a, a lot of what, why we've gotten through to the cloud has also been our clients. Clients are there. They're asking, saying, hey, when are you, when are you going to come along? So we're, we're on this journey with our clients, and so what we're, we're finding is, is that the clients want us to meet them there. They want, they, they want to start to receive their data in a connected form. They don't really want to get FTPs and files and all these different bits kind of cut and sent across to them and they have to stitch it together. They're looking for this connected space. So we're, we're early on this journey, but we already are partnering with clients in order to, uh, to uh, work through Snowflake sharing and in order to get data um, just showing up on their doorstep as opposed to shuttling it across and having them reconstituted in their environment. It, so it's it, very transfer transformational. It, it, and it's live data, essentially. Live right? data. I mean, okay, and so 
I want to, Cindy, I want to ask you, because your experience yeah. as an analyst prior to ThoughtSpot, and you've seen the pendulum swings. I won't go back to the mainframe in the early Oracle days, <laughs> yeah, but, but I will go back to, to Hadoop. The promise of Hadoop was, hey, we're going to solve all world's problems, we're going to bring the compute to the data, and then we found out it was way too hard. Yeah. And then you had to be sort of a geek to really get into you know, Sparkland, that's fine. Snowflake <laughs> comes along and says, hey, we're going to make this really easy. Great, so put everything into Snowflake, run ThoughtSpot on top, scale of the cloud, accessibility. Now, this is all these open data formats, so the pendulum is now swinging back. How do you ensure that there is, I know it's an overused term, but this single version of the truth, that yeah. billings means the same thing no matter which application it's in. What's your experience there and, and what's your vision in terms of preserving that yeah. unity? So, as Mark mentioned, it's about not moving the data. That is a legacy process, and Rebecca, you referred to the people change management. And so moving the data is a legacy process and mindset. Setting up things like data sharing and clean rooms is really important. But it, it and, and I come back to the data is just one piece of the puzzle. The things that Bank of New York Mellon has accomplished with ThoughtSpot, letting the business users ask their questions at the point of impact without having to go through a dashboard developer as an expert and as a middle person is really what changes the game and unlocks the value of all that data. So whether it's, and you know, we can't get too specific, whether it's what are payment times looking for this one line of business versus another, and asking that in natural language, this is also where the people change management, there are power shifts. So when you have democratized data access, those that are performing well, love it. Those who are not performing well, now you have to say, do we have a good culture, a learning culture? And I'll, just another industry, a CPG customer that I work with, through this they were able to identify um, stockouts and eliminate stockouts by 20%. That is millions of dollars in potentially missed sales from a stockout. So I think this power shift, along with the tech modernization and democratized insights, is where the true value is. So is it changing the way organizations recruit? I mean, what you're talking about is this learning culture, this growth mindset, this having to learn new technologies. Um, and as you said, the people who are doing well continue to do well because that's what they're doing already and the laggards kind of fall by the wayside. But how would you describe how it's changing the way organizations, the kind of skills that they're looking for and the kind of um, traits and attributes they want in employees. Yeah, and so I'll speak industry level and then Mark, sure. you to share from your yeah. team, the, the, the talent wars have never been fiercer. Everyone wants to hire an LLM expert today. But you know what, LLM experts that existed were you know, in the handful 18 months ago. So what you need to recruit for is curiosity and who is the fastest learner. That is both from the core data job as well as the leaders. The leaders that can combine business, what's their imagination, how can I apply generative AI to this business problem, and they understand the tech stack, those are the ones that are much further ahead in this wave of disruption than those that are stick their head in the sand and, and wake me up when this wave is over. <laughs> what I'm also seeing though is, is that the um, the, the power of some of the generative AI solutions that we have, like within our company there's a AI hub team that's really um, focused on, on taking that hill as it relates to AI within the firm and the strategy and they have a, an app that they've wrapped around these tools called Eliza. And what I've seen with that is, is that it really brings the, um, the access barrier way down. So you know, in, in a number of instances, you don't necessarily need the, uh, lots of the specialists and the LLM modelers. What you need are people who are, are creative, understand their business flow, and have been uh, um, asking for uh, tools and methods in order to solve problems. So what, what I'm really seeing is, is that there's a lot of energy within the firm because there are, there are 
teams that know their businesses, know their clients really well, and now they suddenly have this uh, additional, let's call it AI assist uh, co-pilot in order to help them um, uh, bring those ideas to, to fruition. Eliza, that's an interesting name. Do you it know is. There, do you, I wonder if the, it's, it's the same. Do you know there was a, the first chatbot, I believe, ever was called Eliza. The, the, there's, there's a story around Eliza. I'm, I'm not going to try to say it because I think I'll get it wrong, but it has, uh, I think it has some ties with our firm's history and, and uh, some okay. other bits. Yeah. So, yeah, they called it a chatterbot back then. <laughs> And they, you know, they were amazed that like we are today at Gen AI, and then it sort of died. Well, Eliza is like pretty smart now, <laughs> and and she's getting smarter by the day. Like well, I mean, think about Pygmalion, Eliza Doolittle. She learned. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's. I mean, that's... okay. Now you're taking me back to my starring role in junior high. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to ask about more about disruption. We had a farmer on yesterday, and this individual mm -hmm. predicted that there'll be a 30 to 40 percent disruption in his data pipeline in the next you know, three or four years. You know, Jamak Tagani has done a very good job of sort of describing the hyper-specialized roles within a data pipeline and the pain of actually getting to stock out, that stock out example. Yeah. You just need so many experts. How do you see Gen AI sort of changing um, all the heavy lifting that we need to do? Yeah, and so two parts. So Jamak Tagani, love her work, have had her on the Data Chief podcast as well, but I think more than the tech, what she got people to think differently about, that BNY also applies, is that domain ownership mm -hmm. and agility. That you cannot just have one centralized data warehouse, slow monolithic, all the pipelines going there. So I do think Gen AI will help with things like data observability, but also um, crowdsourcing the business definitions do you call something bookings or revenues? Um, so crowdsourcing the business definitions, both for the pipelines and also for the dashboards, the insights that you're creating. Um, improving data quality as well, looking for those outliers without it having to be so rule-based. Those are the opportunities I see. I, I also see it, um, I've seen some really interesting things where uh, it will also lower the barrier to being able to, to work with data. So, like, I'm a SQL, SQL guy, and, and I can do you know, some pretty interesting things with SQL. What I'm also seeing is, is that with the, the advent of, of LLMs and additional tooling, that, that starts to kind of go away, and so you can start to then have people who haven't had to to spend the, the time kind of learning that technical skill, suddenly the, that the, they're able to still work with the data, get to insights that they just couldn't otherwise get to before without having to lean on someone else. So that, that, that efficiency is going to be really strong from an outcome perspective. And then within the data pipelines, I do see the ability for um, much more um, uh, AI assist in terms of classification, labeling, you know, think information classification. Think about you know, uh, you know, twenty thousand tables with X number of fields. The surface area is huge, so you need to have some form of human and uh, sorry, human assist uh, there to in order to get it right um, and to scale that out. Because otherwise, you know, previously you could only govern a small amount of of highly governed regulatory data, now you really want to be able to unleash that data for all sorts of outcomes. You need to have something that's going to help you scale. Yeah, and I'm not a SQL guy, and I don't want to be, <laughs> but I know my data better than the technical people know the data. Yeah. And so, to the point you were making earlier, Cindy, about the organizational aspects of Jamak's work, it, it, to be able to truly democratize the data, you need that human input of those who actually are in the know. Yeah. Um, and, at the same time, it's got to be governed. It can't be it Wild West. It does. It's got to be those curious, creative, liberal <laughs> arts graduates. <laughs> Finally, Mark, uh, the year's half over, but I'd be interested to hear your aspirational goals for, for the rest of 2024 and even into 2025. So look, the, the, the key goal for us has been um, trying to stand up this governed, uh, tenanted Snowflake platform that kind of unleashes creativity within the firm. Also now adding to that, how do we make the, uh, a service like ThoughtSpot fully tenanted as well? Uh, the data gravity is starting to shift um, dramatically from on-prem to cloud. 
So as we, as we get to the, that um, data gravity shifting, one of the aspirational goals is to start to look at how do we simplify our lives? How do we start to look at, at, at ThoughtSpot SaaS offering? Um, how do we then, uh, that in itself is going to create more efficiencies and unlock even more features and functionalities that we wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise be able to, to go after. Excellent, well Mark and Cindy both, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, a really great conversation. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having us. I'm Rebecca Knight, stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.